listen to drummers, do some studying, lift, transcribe, take time and listen to those that have done it. And from there, you can make a decision and say, I like that. Have fun, be free, make mistakes, try a bunch of stuff. From there, listen back to it, study yourself, write a few fills out and see what you can come up with.
my goodness. <laughs> That's not fair, eh? That's not fair. Oh. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to another Drumio lesson. I'm here with my buddy Larnell Lewis. Larnell, how you doing, Matt? I'm good. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Yeah. That was unbelievable. Thank you. Holy cow. <laughs> I am so honored to be able to sit beside you oh, um, dude. And, and witness that. Thank you. What was that song called? That song's called Change Your Mind. Right. Yeah. It's actually off of my latest album. Yeah. The album's called In The Moment, so please check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an un unreal song. Definitely go check that out. And this is not your first time at Drumeo here. This is your third time, I believe, right? Yeah, third, Second maybe third? even fourth. Maybe even fourth. Yeah. Um, and we have a real special relationship with Larnell because you were one of the first um, big drummers that mm. Yamaha brought to us back in, ooh, I think, 2012. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. what it was. Yeah, I did the uh, electronic drum kit. Yeah, that's yeah, right. DTX that's right. 900. Yeah. Um, and it was really cool because I remember going out for dinner afterwards and I asked, we asked you, like, what do you want to, uh, where do you see yourself? What do you want to do? And you says, oh, I want to eventually play with Snarky Puppy. And then the next time we brought you out, I'm like, what are you up to? He's like, I'm playing with Snarky yeah. Puppy. <laughs> and now we brought you out this time. You just told me about, I don't know, maybe an hour ago that one of the songs that you recorded on, um, from a certain artist, just won, uh, what is it, a, a, a Latin Grammy? Latin Grammy, that's right, Alejandro Sanz, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So we're like the lucky charm, you come over here and big, big news. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> and I mean more big news. Uh, my wife and I had our second child. That's right. Baby girl named Kaya. Congratulations. Thank you, she is six weeks old today. Awesome. Yeah. Everything's good? Everything's great. I miss them like crazy. And Joey's doing well? She's doing well, yes. Good, man. You're very blessed. Very blessed, man. Thank you. Yeah, and Thank you. you guys are all blessed to be able to witness this live lesson today. We're talking about building killer epic fills with the kick drum. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean? That's a good question. To me, what that means is I uh, pay attention to my glasses. <laughs> um, what it basically means is that quite often we hear a lot of drum fills, some that I did just now, and uh, they seem really massive or they have this uh, epic feel to them. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it can be challenging to figure out how to get that together. So we'll have a conversation today, talk about what it is that I do when it comes to getting my bass drum happening within my fills for that really epic feel. Very cool. Looking forward to it. Before we get into it, huge thanks, obviously, to Yamaha, yes. to Zildjian, Evans, Promark, yeah. ProLogic. ProLogic, stick pads. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, your, your setup is unreal. I just wanna quickly talk about this. Uh, I won't spend too long. That is not a floor tom, okay? <laughs> Although it sounds like a floor tom, I'm so shocked how you get such a deep sound from a 14 by seven inch oak snare drum. Love it, when did you start doing that? I started doing that actually after uh, hanging out with uh, Robert Sput C, right? Yeah, And okay. Starkey Puppy. So the night I met them, he had this uh, older snare, forgot the model, but um, he was able to get that really low sound out of like a 14 by five and a half. Yeah. Might have been a Rogers or something, and so I started, you know, pressing it and trying to feel like how loose the head was, yeah. check out the tension on the bottom head, and so um, I'm very thankful that Sput allowed me to yeah. <laughs> kind of build my formula off of what he was doing. It's, it sounds incredible. If you guys are watching this on YouTube or on Drumio, go and rewind and listen, and you won't think that that's a Tom. I, I was shocked. And you also got a bunch of electronics over here, which we filmed some cool stuff. We'll be releasing it on Drumio. We also did a really killer course with you called The Blueprint to Soloing. By far, it's, in my opinion, one of the best soloing courses we've ever filmed. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that I've ever seen. Cool. Um, so definitely check that out, drumio.com, if you want to look more into that. Uh, and if you want to follow Larnell, Larnell Lewis Music. Okay, that's uh, Instagram, that's YouTube, that's Facebook, and your URL for your website is larnellewismusic.com. That is correct. Twitter's the only odd one out, though. Yep. Lewis underscore Larnell. Larnell underscore Lewis. I was close. Yeah. I was close. That's okay. I'm, I'm going to have to change that and maybe have a moving party and get everyone to move over to that new address, so look out for it. Yeah, sooner the better, because hopefully you get a big flood of followers. You, you post some killer videos and killer drumming oh, uh, cool. stuff in there, so make sure you give them a like and a follow on those platforms. Before we get into the lesson, though, play us another song, man. Oh, sure. Yeah? Yeah. You got another jazzy piece, I think you call it No Access? I do. The short story is, uh, it's about thinking that you have access, backstage access to a concert. You get there, 
They say your name's not on the door, and you have to have a little bit of a conversation with the uh, the door <laughs> person to to finagle your way in. Love it. So that's what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, take it away.
this, man. So teach us how to do that. I want to I learn, learn how to do that, Larnell. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Sick playing, buddy. I Thank love that you. tune. Very, Thank very you. cool stuff. I, I think we could do a lesson, where well, it's not even a lesson, it's just an hour of Larnell playing. Thumbs up if you agree with that. <laughs> yeah, you guys want that? <laughs> yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> um, but uh, we do want to learn something about those fills that you were playing there. Absolutely. And, and your foot is insane. I, I, how you get so fast with just one pedal is unreal. We, we, we'll talk about that more inside of Dromeo. Yeah. Um, but take it away. Build us an epic fill using your kick. Okay. So... We're going to go through a few ways of uh, building an epic fill. We're going to take our time and just look at some of the, the pillars to making some of that stuff happen. Now, for me, it took me a while to understand that I didn't always have to play double kick. I didn't always have to play two kicks before I played a fill or mm. within my fill. Sometimes when you do play two kicks, it might take away from the power excuse me, that the power, the power that your fill actually can have in the musical context. Now, some of the stuff we're gonna look at, again, we're gonna start slow, so that means simple. And kind of like within jazz harmony, we look at a triad, which is three notes, and we add what's called an approach note. So a note just before the three notes. So you might hear one, two, three, four, da, 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 right? One, two, three, four, da, da, da. You're gonna add an approach note. Three, four, ba, da, da, da. Three, four, one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. So that eighth note that's happening just before that triad is the kind of concept we're gonna pull into the drum kit. Hmm. Now, I'm gonna play a couple of things, some, some fills with my hands, very simple fills. I'm gonna play them without the bass drum within the fill. And then I'm gonna add some bass drum just before the fill starts. All right? Okay. Nice. Cool. Yeah, so it's not a part, it's not starting on the one, it's almost like a pickup into the fill. Exactly. And I hope you were able to check or understand why that helps. It helps because you get this presence, this uh, energy from the bass drum going into, from a lower pitch to a higher pitch. So you get the ear listening for that kick and then the snare comes in. Sometimes it's what you need and sometimes it's not what you need. But either way, understanding why it feels the way it feels is important and understanding where to use it is as important, just as important. Perfect. Yeah. And this works with any fill? Like that was a cool fill that you were doing there. Can you maybe show us just one or two more examples with this concept? Yeah. You call it the approach note or the yeah. pickup into the fill? Absolutely. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. Okay, what's, what's another idea? All right. Another idea is now getting into adding double kicks. Within the same concept of understanding 
that frequency balance around the drum kit, you want to think about starting your phrase on the downbeat with some kick drums or putting the kick drums on the back end of the fill that you're playing. We're going to use a very simple fill, just 16th notes. Um, the first two 16ths I'll do without the kick first, or at least kick on the back end. So the first two 16ths will be snare, and the last two 16ths will be kick. Now you're probably familiar with this fill, but we're going to understand, or at least try to understand, why the weight of the sound of the bass drum at the back end, like how it, how it affects what's going on, and also how it affects what's going on when it's on the front end of that fill. Okay. Cool? Yeah. All right, here's the first example. Yeah. So that's snare and then the kick. Now we're going to go kick and then snare. So what, the difference, you can hear the difference, but what, are, what is the um, importance for drummers to know about the, that difference? Great question. So the importance of understanding the difference between starting with your kick and putting the kick on the back end of maybe that short cell phrase that you're doing is because in the context of a song, sometimes something might be happening that you don't want to get in the way of. Quite often I hear from engineers and producers that there might be too much kick on a certain part of a section, a certain part of maybe, let's say, the drum chant of a song, right? Which ultimately a drum chant of a song is just kind of like the conversation between kick and snare. Um, so they want to make, maybe make that a little bit lighter because in the mix, when you're going to mastering, uh, there might be too much bottom end and it gets in the way of everything else that's happening in the track. So from a producer's standpoint, you want to be very aware of what's happening on the kick drum. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but what also happened was because it decided to play kick drums first, it actually displaced my snare. Hmm. So my snare was no longer on the backbeat. Now that's another story for another time, but the short version of that is to sometimes just, not sometimes, always be aware of where your snare is landing, if it needs to be on the backbeat while you're playing a fill, which helps the forward motion, or like some people say, to break up the feel of that section by not playing the snare on the backbeat. And one way you could do that is to just add some kicks in the beginning of a pattern similar to that, and it actually opens things up a little more and pushes the snare drum just slightly right of center so you're not playing it on the backbeat. Interesting. Yeah. So that. Two and two, that's a very common hand of a combo. Many drummers might know it, like you said at the beginning. This concept though of adding kick to the beginning and to the end, mm -hmm. can you show some other examples where it fits beyond that one fill? Absolutely. So I'll just kind of play around a little bit and just experiment with the phrasing and make sure that within the phrasing I'm gonna be putting kicks on the beginning, very obviously, and also putting them on the back end as obviously Perfect. as obvious as I can make it. Yeah. Cool.
Okay, so there were a few extra things in there. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes double kicks, sometimes single kicks. Uh, something that I like to do is as I'm playing phrases across the toms, I like to insert kicks in there as well. And the bass drums that I'm adding are representative, a representation of the accent pattern that I'm thinking of, right? So, I'm, and when I'm playing a groove, I'm, if I'm thinking, right, you can hear a very clear sonic kind of, you know, just descending all the way to the lower drums. Every now and again, I might put a kick in before we get all the way to the end. I might even end the phrase on the floor tom, which actually helps to also open up the feel of the arrival of that downbeat. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, you might have to watch, the, listen to that part again, rewind, but that um, pretty deep stuff there. And then, and this is the thing, it's like, this is more conceptual stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you can obviously copy what he just did and maybe learn some cool fills with what you played there, but it's the idea behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your kicks always come, so, come through so clean. And um, the spacing is perfect. You have a really good relationship with your hands and your feet. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I spent definitely a lot of time mm -hmm. playing slow, like really slow. And the reason why I played slow was because my teachers told me to. <laughs> so <laughs> listen to your teachers. Yeah. But also I realized after a while that when you play slow, you start to understand what you're doing. Right. You understand now what you're hearing, and as you speed it up, eventually you'll become smoother and you'll start to hear the same phrases, but at a faster pace. And then you speed it up some more, speed it up some more, and that to me is the essence of clarity on the drums. When you can play something at a very fast tempo, but you understand what you're doing, you can hear it, you can think, you can react, kind of like things slowing down in the matrix, but they're really running in real time. I don't know if that reference makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But the whole idea is as, as you get faster, you understand what it is that you're doing. Playing fast without clarity, no, that's, that's not helpful to music or to the listener or to your experience. And, and I really believe that once you start to have a relationship between your hands and drums at a slower tempo, but also understanding how these frequencies work and why we enjoy certain types of drum fills where we're able to bounce between the floor tom and the rack tom or the floor tom and a snare or even like, you know, any kind of fills that we might take the bottom out and start playing on the ride and playing on the cymbals, kind of like this. This is a little more advanced, but I'm just gonna- okay. sure. Just gonna, I'm here to play some drums, yeah, man. Yeah, man, I, let's I hear don't it. know about y'all, but- I'm not gonna say no. Yeah, okay. exactly. So. Here's a quick example. I'm gonna play some fills around the kit. We're talking very quickly about understanding that relationship of low to high and frequency, high to low, and also getting cymbals involved. Maybe not playing a bass drum with your cymbal. Specifically ride, okay? Killer. So I was having some fun, but again, the idea was I was moving up and down at the toms. I got some cymbals involved without the bass drum. Then I started adding the bass drum in. That feeling of the bottom end being present and then being removed is something that happens in music a lot. It happens in arrangements. It happens in uh, production. It happens with DJs mm -hmm. where they just kind of like, you know, do and then there's a huge rise, mm -hmm. and then it's building all this tension. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, tension, tension, right? and release. Yeah, and release. So 
I think I want to continue to hit on tension and release as we go along. So Let's please, as we go along, just hold up that tension release card. Because like, <laughs> that's, that's it. what it's all about, right? It is. And, and, and all of this, a lot of that stuff, people would say, oh, look at those like gospel traps. You hear that term all the time. Yes. That's what it is you're doing, but that's just, it comes out naturally. Because you have that relationship and you understand building that tension and releasing it. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And even within gospel chops, like, you know, being an entity, which is, uh, you know, a group of people that actually were trying to give a little more shine and, and presence to those that were playing in churches that weren't actually able to, to get the respect yeah. in the community, you know? Amazing, amazing players, but needed a platform. Yep. And, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to be on a drumio. I mean, I'm absolutely blessed to be here. And so, you know, outside of that title, I, I think very, very, very important to understand that, you know, there are parts of gospel drumming that are, you know, there to make the energy of the music just like bubble and percolate and just do this like, ah. Yeah. But you can also find that tension and release in a lot of different styles of music. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a matter of how everyone hits the drums. It's their just general stroke. Maybe some people play more rim shots when they're playing. Mm -hmm. Maybe they play more snare center. Maybe they're more dynamic. Maybe they're just, there are no dynamics and everything is very even. So this concept, like you're saying, you know, it's, it, it might have a label, it might not, but tension and release is absolutely the name of the game. Perfect, man. Yeah. I love it. Do you, do you have one more tip or another point? Yeah, you know what? About? Yeah, I'll, I'll shoot one more there. So <clears throat> quite often I like to do... Um, double strokes on my snare, or sometimes called diddles. So for now, we'll call them diddles. And in between what I'm playing, I like to have these rolling diddles on the snare drum while I'm adding kick drums and other toms and other, you know, instruments, kit pieces, just flying and floating around, again, with accent patterns, right? So I'm gonna show you a very simple one that you can build on. Sounds great when you speed it up, as most things do. You know, they have a lot of energy to them. And it's one that actually goes back and forth between right hand lead and left hand lead. Okay. So I'll explain it very quickly. Right, left, left, right, right, kick. Sounds like this. Okay. I'm gonna add an accent on that first single stroke. I could play that again with my right hand. But it can be challenging, so I'm gonna to flip to the left. Okay. Now, similar to what we were talking about before, the kick is on the back end, which means this fill is featuring the snare, but that tension or that forward motion is being brought about from the kick drum being placed on the up. Why? Because we're used to the kick drum adding that release on a groove, especially mm -hmm. in funk. In funk music, that kick is on the one, like this. very heavy presence on the downbeat, right? When you start to syncopate it or push it on another beat that might not be a strong beat, it again changes the way things feel, it adds a little tension because you're throwing things off center. So same groove, kick drum on the last 16th. Okay. Huh. Now, again, staying with the idea of tension and release, the release comes from the snare happening on the downbeat, but it's a nice little cocktail because that kick is actually happening just before the snare. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. Here's that fill again. A little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Any slower or faster? Faster now. Faster. Man, All faster. right, faster. Right, fine, faster, fine. Faster. You, you don't have to twist my arm. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. 
Ah. That is a mighty fine cocktail. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> a kicking cocktail. A kicking cocktail. There you go. <laughs> right. So again, to repeat, it's a fill that I love to play quite often. I like to use six stroke rolls, you know, um, replacing the kick every now and again. And understanding that the relationship between the kick and the snare and how it sits within that pattern that you're playing can really, kind of, it can really spice up your fills. It could spice up what's happening. So be creative. Now show us that in context. All right. Yeah. And at, at that, whatever tempo you want. Whatever tempo. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> with a nice swung feel to that too. That's yeah. Killer. So your kick is one of the most important things I think in in your sound with your fills. From what I'm hearing, like it, it's coming coming through so clearly, so crisp. You can play it so fast too, and you have great tension release and you're playing. How does a drummer, a beginner drummer, intermediate drummer, use this stuff in their own practice? Okay. So start slow. Always start slow, but not too slow. The reason why I suggest not too slow is because sometimes a part of what you're doing, really what you're doing is you're kind of dancing on the kit, mm -hmm. right? So there's a very physical aspect to what you're doing. Now, if you're moving really slowly and you don't give time to compensate for the strokes that you're playing, then things start to fall apart. Mm. They fall apart because as you're trying to play this fill, you're concerned about hitting something rather than the motion of aiming towards hitting something, which is very, very important to staying in time, right? Uh, 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 uh. Nothing is wasted in that motion. It's all about understanding that the whole entire motion is a part of that beat. It's not just about what you're hitting. There's a whole, even though it might be a very staccato sound, like my stack, right? If I were to play it, you know, maybe four times in a row. I'm not waiting to get all the way up here like this, I'm not going. <laughs> Unless I want to be a bit of a showboat, that's not what we're going for. So that full motion, range of motion is important. It gets smaller as you get faster. The range of motion you're using gets smaller when you start to play faster. But you have to consider it. You have to give it that time. Mm. So, starting slow, but not too slow. Then, write some ideas out. And if you got a phone, I hope you do, and I hope you have some space on there, and delete some of the maps that you don't need, <laughs> right? And dedicate some, some gigabytes to your, to your practice time. Just turn on a recorder, voice recorder, whatever you can download, and record yourself playing. Mm -hmm. Have fun, be free, make mistakes, try a bunch of stuff. From there, listen back to it, study yourself, write a few fills out, and see what you can come up with. So that specifically is the creativity part. So now we talked about really being honest with our practice, talked about being you know, very strict about playing slow, but not too slow, and then getting the content together, mm. right? Which is coming from your bag or your uh, musical opinion, as I like to call it, which is also your style. Right, musical opinion meaning what you choose to do when you are met with a challenge. And from there, just start to build things. The last one is do a lot of listening. I think it's underestimated how much listening to other drummers helps you build your own sound. 
I think the misconception often is that if you sit down and only build and listen to yourself, that you will create something that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. You might get this sound that's mystically going to just like, you know, yeah. the good Lord's gonna like, just drop some drum fills on you. The spirit of fills yeah. <laughs> is just gonna come upon you and the next thing you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have it. No. Listen to drummers. Do some studying. Lift. Transcribe. Take time and listen to those that have done it and from there, you can make a decision and say, I like that, I don't like that. I think that's really important. So mm -hmm. to recap, to work on this, very slowly, I would recommend maybe about 70 BPM, Okay. right? And your fills might be at 16th notes at 70 BPM. And I think I might just prepare to do a quick example of sure. that. Sure, yeah. So at 70 BPM, so your 16th notes, okay? And even you can go eighth notes, you can go eighth notes as well. Now, 70 BPM, eighth note or 16th note grid, okay? And you wanna create content. Now, making sure you're playing snare as your backbeat throughout the fills is, again, an underrated concept. It helps the forward motion, it allows the listeners to still understand what you're doing and you could still express yourself, but the song doesn't feel like it's being sacrificed or you're not breaking up the fill as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. okay? So I would recommend 70 BPM, an eighth note or 16th note grid for your fill idea. I would also recommend playing no more than a bar of a drum fill, okay. then go to a bar of a groove. The reason why I suggest that is so that you can have the opportunity to recalibrate yourself right. after playing that fill and think about how you want to change. Maybe you hit that rack tom too hard. Maybe your bass drum was too soft. Maybe the sound you're going for isn't right. Maybe your positioning and how you're moving around the kit doesn't feel that great. So you want to have an opportunity to play it and groove and then play it and groove. F absolutely fantastic. Yeah. That was... The, one of the best five minutes you guys can get <laughs> on Drumio, man. W well said. Thank you. Larnell is a teacher professor at Humber College. Yes. Out in Toronto. And uh, I can see why. And your students are very lucky. Oh, man. Um, Thank you. If you get a chance to check him out in a clinic in your area, um, or if you want to see more of him inside of Drumio, or if you want to see more of him on his social channels, follow him. Go to those clinics if you get the opportunity, because <laughs> uh, you 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 have so much knowledge and you're so well spoken. Thank you. Um, you're you're clear on both the way you explain things and the way you play the drums, and I absolutely love it. Is there anything you want to say to the community before we wrap up? <sighs> yeah. Be kind to one another. I think now more than ever, we need to have more compassion and love for each other. I think times are getting harder. I think, you know, things are becoming more confusing on a lot of different fronts. Mm -hmm. I mean, drums are confusing enough, which is why Drumio exists, right? And so, you know, be kind to one another. We need this community that we have right here in order to sustain a flow of thought and a flow of expression that'll be positive for years to come. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we're gonna wrap up. Like, that was so, so amazing. I'm gonna be watching this a couple times oh, myself. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so, hey, thank you so of much. Of course, thank you. Um, again, follow him, Larnell Lewis Music. That's his tag or handle on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube, and Larnell underscore Lewis on Twitter. Yeah, and check the record as well in yeah. the moment. Juno nominated album from Crazy. this year, which That's is awesome. So good, man. As a composer, it's a great thing. Huge congrats on that. Huge congrats on the new one in your life. Thank you. Huge congrats on the Latin Grammy. Yeah. Onwards and upwards, as Dom Famulera would say. Absolutely. So let's leave this with uh, another play along. Now, this is a track. I threw him, I, I don't know if you guys have seen, but I've been throwing some of our artists that come out here, songs that they've never heard before, and I force them to learn it on the fly, and we film it. 
And Larnell's like, I want to do that. So I sent him a song. He's only heard this maybe three or four times. He's only played it once, but you freaking slayed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a play along inside a drum called Chick's Pain. I'm going to have you play us out with that. Okay. And then I'm going to do something a little cheeky here. Everyone, when I said I could do a whole lesson with you just playing the whole time, they all said thumbs up. So after you're done, Chick's Pain, do you want to do us a solo after? Yeah. Stop the song and then just play us a, an open solo as long as you want to go. Nice. Awesome. I dig. Bye, everyone. Peace. <laughs>